So I took a quick look at it on my real device, and even at that distance you can probably still see how cool it looks on a real device. You don't have the, the plain old um, you know, gray colors anymore. You have these cool new colors that I chose, so it's a real change. One little thing, beta testing always, actually alpha testing at this point, but you're always testing it because if I go over to my about screen, my about screen doesn't quite look right. My about screen's pop-up is still kind of inheriting other colors, uh, theme A colors, actually. So about screen needs a little bit of tweaking. I could have seen it when I was testing it here. If I open about, there it is. So theme A colors are still showing through somewhat. This pop-up, this happens because this pop-up is behaving in a different kind of way than these other sections. These have a data role of page, whereas the this one up here also has a data, I believe it has a data dialogue, data role of dialogue. So it's behaving a little differently. This is another example where, okay, I need to write some custom CSS to change this. Uh, we might be able to figure it out here in the theme roller that there's some spot that is opening the um, you know, if I click option one here, I don't know, it, we, it may be an element that I find here or not within the theme roller, but if, if we can't do it, we always have the inspector. So let me show you on the inspector how I would figure this out. Um, I've got it in the browser and I've opened up the project and I've got this screen, this errant screen. What I would do is get, of course, the selector element selector. Hover my mouse over a little bit, you know, maybe trying to find the background color before I even click yet. Not the picture, of course, not there, but maybe I kind of figured it out somewhere around here. That, that grabbed it there. This is article. Okay, looking around there. I'm trying to see if I find that that color anywhere in my code here, maybe not on the maybe not on the first uh, try. Maybe I have to find it further up the chain. Here it's not maybe it's not article content. Maybe it's further up in this about up on the chain. There's a div. So again, how do I figure this out? I'm clicking on the different pieces that this is made up, and I'm looking over here, keeping an eye out for background color. I should be able to see, in my case, this baby blue color. You should see a little swatch over here, baby blue. I haven't quite found it yet, so maybe one higher level in the design. And so, I'm seeing something here, UI overlay. That's not quite it, but that's something else. That's the background color behind everything. It's, it's not uh, crossed out, meaning that the rule has been completely removed, but I believe that means there's it's depreciated. So, just to check something here, if I put red, that could be a change that I make. You see what's happening is there's an overlay background color behind everything, and that color is peeking through even onto this. The tricky part is that technically this is transparent. This element here is transparent, and then the overlay is behind it. So that's why when I when I put a red background on UI overlay A, I I see red. But it's going to be a different element. Also, um, if you're interested, I will write this in the code just to just for completeness. But to change the background color behind the background color behind the um, the dialog box it's UI overlay a so dot UI dash overlay dash a it's behind it but it's still an overlay because it's overlaying what was used what used to be there <clears throat> the home screen. So if I want a background color there, uh, I'll, I'll figure out the right color in just a moment because it has to depend on what my original, what my colors there are of the theme that I rolled. I'm going to have to pull that from elsewhere in a moment. But uh, this 
just put pink as a placeholder. That, that'll be obvious that it was changed. So that's causing the overlay background color of swatch A. Um, I guess there's a difference between A and B and all of that. To be safe, what I could do is comma U, uh, dot UI dash overlay dash B. The comma right here says apply the following property and value to this class and to this class. And there's a space that doesn't mean and. What this is saying is this element basically is inside of this element, with the space. With the comma, it means do this, do this, to this and to this. So here, just to hedge my bets, uh, with the overlay A and B, it's changing it. You know, I, I guess I really shouldn't have it for theme overlay A because then that's going to override the blue that I do want when I'm using theme A, if I'm using theme A. So you have to figure out. Maybe you chose data theme equals B equals C. So then this, I would need an overlay C. So in my case, I guess I'll just do overlay B because I, I chose B. Do you see the logic of it? There's overlay A, B, C, all the way up to Z. And in my case, I'm with B. The actual, where did I see it? The actual background color. So I saw it during the break, and now that I'm looking for it again, there is a rule here with a descendant. So if you find it, it's going to be something about something with an angle bracket, a right angle bracket. So I saw it during the break, but let me look at it again here.
So you see this goes to show about the um, the complexity of all of these pieces together. Um, right before the when we were in the break, I saw which particular rule this was, and I can't find it at the moment. So I'll look it up in a little bit. But the point is that um, this background color isn't being affected. It's still the original um, the original theme. So We'll get back to it, but this is what's required then when um, making these sorts of changes. There's a lot of puzzle pieces in in effect. I see the pink color there briefly when I close that, that overlay. But anyway, that, that comes from making those changes. So in my case, I wanted a specific color, <coughs> the color that I had made out of the theme roller. When I was over on jQueryMobile.com, I simply dragged a color onto the spot that I wanted, and it was a color. But now I need that color to refer to it if I'm making these changes. So I found that color by you know, selecting in the design the, the color I want, and then I, in my case, I saw it right there. It's that orange color. Yours is probably something else, but selecting the main body, I found over there background color, that color, and that's the color I want to use um, in my particular design. So that's what I, I put in there, the <coughs> hexadecimal color. You can put that color, but it's probably not the color that you used in your theme, so you should figure out your color the way I showed you there. Let's say at that point, then, um, I made those changes, and I want to go over to um, the font. We've been making these changes to the color of the design, but I also now want to start to change the font. We've got this basic, um, readable, utilitarian font, which is defined up on the top over here, at the very top of our CSS, robot, regular, etc. What I said about that is that CSS is designed, when we use the font family property, it's designed to have fallbacks from left to right. We're trying to use a certain font. If that one doesn't work, comma, try the next one. If that one doesn't work, comma, try the next one. Well, all of these, Cordova, Taco, gives us a set of rules here to try to use these fonts native to the to the particular device we're on. Roboto, Regular, Android Sans are two Android-specific fonts. Those two most likely are built into every Android phone. Roboto, Regular, I think that's like Android 4.0 and up, and then Droid is 4.0 and below. So this is the default Android font. If we're not on Android, we may be on a Windows device. That's Segoe UI and Segoe Plane. So if we have Sego um, on a Windows device, I think Sego UI is Windows 10 and Sego is Windows 8. So if we're on that device, use its native font. If we're not on that device, the next device is um, iOS. So we have Helvetica New and Helvetica um, again, one is depending on which version. Oh, actually, also San Francisco. San Francisco, I think it's like iOS 9 and up, and Helvetica is like iOS 7 and up, and Helvetica <coughs> is lower. They've got Arial in Geneva, so even more basic fonts that every device probably has. And then the most basic is a sans serif. A sans serif font means without serif. The serifs are are the little ornamentations on a font. So let me show it to you this way. Uh, pad. And right here, sans serif. Okay, and then 
contrasting with serif. So sans serif font doesn't have the extra ornamentation of a letter. Notice the S on sans serif and then serif. There's this extra bit of design on the letter. Same thing on the R here. So the R is just plain old R. But then on the R of the serif, it has this extra little ornamentation. And look at how that E is over here, the little tail of it here. Look at these base lines for the F. They all have that sort of base line. But that doesn't. So the sans serif is just the most basic font that doesn't have any or ornamentation. The serif font is a basic font that has ornamentation. Depending on various factors, one is more readable than the other. But if we're looking on our project, we have sans serif fonts for many aspects of it. Look at the top over here. My SDCE sans serif, sans serif. Back on the about. Yeah, everywhere it's got this sans serif style. Um, which is what our CSS is telling us here. D Roboto, Regular, and Droid Sans are both sans serif fonts. They don't have that extra ornamentation. So if we want to change our font, we can. It takes a few steps, and that's what we'll talk about now. So the traditional methods for doing different fonts on the web have been uh, limited by the user's device. If I add to, you don't have to do this, but if I add to my font family here, Chiller, what that does is it activates the Chiller font. Not everywhere, but look at that. It's a nice scary font, Chiller, up there too. So if the, if the user has the font chiller, it uses the font. And this has been something that's happened from like almost like day one of the web, well, version two or so, in that if the user has the font, we can call the font and it'll apply it. Now chiller is a font that only exists on Windows. You don't have chiller on the Mac. You don't have chiller on Android. You don't have chiller on Windows Phone. So this is not a safe method, what I did right here, simply calling a font is not the safe method. And if a device doesn't have chiller, then it'll default to these other ones. But the concept is here, if I'm able to, I can name a font and I will use it. In order for us to have safeguards, however, we have to use something known as the, what do we call it, the at font face rule. This special CSS rule will allow us to, in a sense, link to a specific font file, and then we would be able to access, so this is not real code, but we would be able to access, you know, font family and then chiller.ttf, because ultimately chiller is a file on the computer, chiller.ttf. Again, this wouldn't quite work, on a, on a Mac, because there is no file like that on, um, on the Mac or on, a, on an iPhone. And we'll see in a moment that we can have a path, and this path would be something like www slash fonts slash chiller. Well, that's a path in our app. So we could bundle the chiller font in the project um, and then call it via this CSS. Okay, we're getting there. That's much. That's a much safer way to do this. We're we're confirming the font that we need is is found. But again, this the problem here is that well, TTF is a very old font uh, type. There's been newer ones that have. There's been newer ones that have come out like OTF. So not every device still would be able to run or understand what's TTF. 
it would expect OTF. There's other ones as well. There's even newer one, WAFF, W-O-F-F. And then there's also other ones, other ways we could do it. We could do it with an SVG. We could do it with a vector font. Okay, there's different font, uh, font formats. The way I'm going to show you is it'll cover all the bases. I'm going to generate a font face um, bit of code, and it will cover all of the possibilities of fonts. Then we will include the font in the project. It'll be converted to all the proper types, and therefore any device can use it. And then we can safely use any font that we want throughout the project. All of this code here is just pseudo code. It wasn't quite real, so I'm not going to write it just yet. And the beauty of this method is that, in theory, we could use any font. So if we take a quick look at the website 1001freefonts.com, Guess what's on this website? 1001 free fonts. Before we get too excited with this, this is, this is a bit of a tease. Because fonts are like other intellectual property, in that most likely they're owned by someone. Yes, the website is called 1001 free fonts, but the thing is that if uh, I were to want to use a graphic, on my app or my website or anything, I would have to have the permission. I would have to have the copyright to be able to use it. If I simply go to Google and search for a picture of a cupcake, I'll find a million results of cupcakes. If I'm trying to make an app for my cupcake selling business, I need a picture of a cupcake. So if I go to Google and search cupcakes, I found a cupcake. But most likely that, cup, that cupcake is owned by the photographer that shot the photo or the company that originally hired the photographer. So I don't have the right to use a copy of it. That's copyrights. I don't have a right to copy that photo of that font. Yes? Uh, so if that photo is copyrighted, does that mean that it has to be paired with some commercial right? This world of copyrights is so tricky that my short answer is don't use any photo that you are not sure you own the copyright to. It's such a tricky thing because simply giving the notice that it's copyright someone else, that might not be enough. Someone might say, you stole my property. Here's my lawyer. Worst case scenario. Best case scenario is they say, that's my photo. Please remove it, even if you gave them credit. Because think about it in terms of a real cupcake. I have a real cupcake on the shelf of my business. And if you take it and display it on the counter of your business, you stole it, even though you said, well, I'm giving you free advertising. No, you walked out of my shop with my cupcake. With a font or a photo, it's the same thing. Someone owns it somehow, some way. So it's much safer, the way I'm about to show you, to be sure we're using the right, the right elements. So I'm showing us this website, but uh, there's another website that I would recommend even more because these fonts might be free for some purposes and not other purposes. And this is a big tease. Lots of cool fonts here, but here's where I really want you to go. I want you to go to fontsquirrel.com. Fontsquirrel.com. Fontsquirrel, 100% free for commercial use. Because that other 1001 free fonts might have said in the fine print somewhere, free for use on your website. But it doesn't say free for your app. And it might even say each individual font might have its own restrictions. And one particular font might say free for everything, except commercial purposes. And our app right now is not a commercial purposes app. We're not trying to sell anything in our app. But if you're building your own real app or you are selling something, you've got a commercial use. So somewhere in that 1001 free fonts, and you didn't read the fine print, you might have accidentally gotten a font that wasn't okay for you to use. This website is all about that, and it's not going to have the 1001 fonts that you can find on that other site. It's not going to have the million results that you do a Google search for. But I would much rather have you be safe in using the right fonts to avoid any sort of you know, litigious problems. You never know. Maybe you're never caught. Maybe nothing ever happens. But if something does happen, best case scenario is they ask you to remove it. Worst case scenario, here's a lawsuit. 
because fonts themselves have a value, literally, monetary value. If you go over to adobe.com, you can buy fonts, and I've seen fonts there that are $2,000. You can buy a font that's worth more than your computer. Um, because it's a custom-made font, it's a font that has been expertly designed and all of that. Well, I'll stick with Times New Roman. It came with my computer. It came with your computer, but perhaps technically it's not designed for you to use for a commercial purpose app. So this is all a big can of worms, and I talk about it more in my other classes like social media and such. For us, if we're going to use a cool font, this is the place I want you to go. Anywhere else, I don't have an opinion. My actual opinion is don't go anywhere else. I would have to research where else you're going, what are the terms and conditions, and all of that. Here, I've used it, I've seen it, I know it works, this is the safest. It doesn't have a thousand and one free fonts, but maybe out of the two dozen that you find here of a particular style, you find the perfect one, and then you're safe. This also has the converter that I'm talking about, because over at 1001 Free Fonts, most likely it'll give you the TTF version, which is not compatible with every device. It's perfectly compatible with Windows devices, but if I'm putting it on an Android device, that 1001 Free Font I got probably is not compatible. This one has a generator, and I'll walk you through it all in a moment. But the point is, here is where we will find fonts that are okay for us to use for commercial purposes, really nice looking ones, in different styles. You can test drive them as I'll show you in a moment. And then to put in these different styles, distress style, and again, 30 styles of monospace, 78 of retro, not 800, but 80. 69 of decorative, not 600, two in grunge style, one in programming style, but a few hundred that are really nice. And let's say I'm interested in one of these uh, typewriter fonts. If I click that section, I get these typewriter style fonts. I could go in and further see, well, can I test drive it? If you click on an actual font name, you'll see samples of it. And the reason this, this is so valuable is, the thing with fonts is that when we discover how to use fonts in our app, we often do it wrong. In that, this font looks great, but if you apply it to the main text of your app, it's looked terrible. That's very hard to read as the main body text. As like a heading one, that's great. As a heading two, that looks really nice. But as a plain old body, a P tag and such, that's very hard to read. I would still say, for any of these cool crazy fonts, save them for headings, because they're usually bigger and easier to read. Don't apply it to the body, the P tags, unless you make P's really big. That's more readable, that's readable, that's not so much, that's not so much. You can further test it by going up to test drive typing something, like the name of the app, ISDCE. That's what that's going to look like, perhaps. As we test these out, we might also see somewhere that it says glyphs. These are the various letters, you know, A through Z, the numbers, the symbols, Maybe you've got a cool font, but it only has 40 glyphs. So the designer only made, you know, 40 letters and symbols. And it doesn't have, they never thought of making the, the O with the accent mark. Well, I'd be able to see all the glyphs right there. So this has these main glyphs, what the license is. This one is freeware. We have, we have, you might see download TTF or download OTF. What you really want is download the web font kit, the at font base kit. This is the one that gives you the version in TTF, in EOT, 
in WAF, in SVG. This is the one that gives you all the different versions that works on all the platforms. Just getting the TTF version will only really work on Windows. Let me see over here under hot. Let's say great vibes. We'll click on that one. Again, that looks really nice as a heading one. As as body, that's terrible, even at a even at a larger size than that. It's not readable. But as a heading, that might look nice. So what you should do then is browse this archive a bit and download maybe two um, two of these when you go over to the web, web kit and some of these like I like this one and I'm looking at the web font kit and this one says the license for this one does now does not allow us to redistribute derivative versions with our wholesale name uh, if you were the designer then this was an uh, okay some of these don't have the built-in font kit for whatever reason. And what you would do, extra step, is you would go through the process of generating it. So a little more effort, but that's why perhaps browse some of these. Maybe I'm liking 1942, I click on it, and if I go to the web font kit, and if it just simply says download, okay, you're done. If it doesn't have the download, you'll have to take an extra step to go up to the generator. And it's pretty straightforward. You can play with that if you want. But download maybe one or two fonts. Try them out a bit because, again, this might look really nice, nice and big, but not so good small. If you see any of these that have a downloadable font face kit, download a couple. Then I'll show you how to use them in just a moment. Some of these say download off-site. Well, that's another extra step you have to do. It's on a different site. They have a partnership or something, and it's on another site. You may want to go there.
Oh, one thing I forgot to mention before we proceed is um, you're going to see these icons below the font. So which different ways can we uh, use the font? So you'll see, you know, desktop, uh, ebooks, PDFs, apps. So hopefully the app that uh, hopefully the font that you're interested in is usable on an app. So another thing to look at. But I downloaded two fonts. We come in a zip file, an anagram, an arm wrestler. You need to extract one or both. We need to extract those folders. <coughs> I downloaded my um, my fonts and then I extracted them as regular folders. So if I take a look at Anagram first, there's a license in there how to use web fonts. A little bit of explanation there. What we actually get inside the web fonts, there's a whole folder, then an item in there. Um, anagram demo in my case. So I downloaded the anagram font, so I have an anagram demo. Then I've got the different versions EOT, SVG, TTF, WAF. You may have more or less. And then a style sheet. And then the demo. So it shows me my font. Sample layout, installing. So it tells me the same sort of thing. Um, the way this works is, well, you need to do a few things. You need to have a reference to the style sheet file that comes with your zip file. In that CSS file, it's got the at font face. That CSS rule that I was starting to talk about a moment ago. And the way this works is, Depending on your font, it will automatically fill itself in. We'll look at it in a moment with font family and the font that I downloaded. Well, we're going to be able to use the name of that font, just like we had. I typed chiller and it worked on Windows. And here I have anagram. There, there is no anagram font on this computer yet. But we'll, I'm going to be able to use the name anagram because of this definition, which says the source of anagram is the URL whatever the font is, EOT, or the Internet Explorer version, or the WAF version, or the TTF. Notice that all of these have a comma. Try this version in the app. If it doesn't work, try this version, comma, or try this version, or this version, or this version. So one of these versions is going to work on your device. So we'll see how to do this, but we, we have a definition waiting for us. We then need to connect the style sheet, and then we can start to use it. So P, tag, font family, my web font, whatever is defined up there, and then we'll start to use it. The details are that in my particular zip bundle, I got these four files and a CSS file. If I take a quick look at the CSS file in Notepad, there's that font face, font family, and mine internally will be known as anagram regular, which is defined by anagramwebfont.eot or WAF or TTF or SVG. And this is going to normalize the font weight and style. So the way to integrate it with the project is I could create folders for organization as long as I have the right paths. Or I could just 
bundle it all in one folder. This is up to you to decide. I'm gonna, for easiest, I'm gonna just put it all in one folder. Um, might get a little messy, so you could create a fonts folder, but make sure your paths are correct. I need the actual font files into my project. And I can either borrow that CSS file and link to it in the index file, or I could simply write the code that's in there into my Kodika CSS file. That way I don't have an extra CSS file cluttering up my project. I just need the code of the CSS file. I might do it that way. Style.css, edit that. I need that whole block of code. And I want to paste that into my Kodika.external CSS at the very top as one of the first things. So here I'm saying, let's use the, in my case, the anagram regular font. What does anagram regular mean? Well, it means one of these fonts, files. And to actually then use it is, I'll make it obvious here, and I, I wouldn't quite want it here, but in the body. Body is saying font family, roboto regular, etc. Now I can say, in my case, single or double quote, doesn't matter, but I'll do single quote, comma, anagram regular. I need the exact name that it that it has up there on my font family definition. And I'm applying it here exactly the same way, spelled exactly the same way, in quotes, single or double, comma, the rest. This is going to apply that font, and if it's a very crazy font, it's going to apply it everywhere, which will be too crazy, but I'm doing it on purpose. Because then most likely I really want to apply it to, you know, an H1. We'll do that in a moment. I want to see this. Um, I should be able to test this straight out of Notepad. I don't have to really run it as a as an app just yet. There's welcome over there and over here. And then the about there it is as well. It didn't change it on my menu because again the other pieces of the puzzle of CSS. If we change it here, not there. Use it in different places where it's a little more readable. I'm just showing you here then. I'm uh, applying the font throughout the project. If I wanted it to only apply to the top over here, like just to the top of the app, not to the actual text and such. This is where I would specify in the CSS, so I don't, I don't really want it as my main body text, so I just put it there to be obvious, but I don't want it there. I want it up on my H1s. Um, or H2s. I think, which we can test it pretty quick. If we've got, if we've got UI header, UI title, I think we can add it there. So font family, font dash family. I'll try it here first. UI header, UI title, font dash family colon, and then the name of my particular font. I might have to further specify an H1. I'll check that in a moment. And that seemed to be enough.
So that's applying then that font up to the top of the app. If I um, wanted it to apply like to these headings, those are heading twos. And I was working on a different size of, I mean, a different color of that. Uh, I mean, a different uh, a different definition of the of the heading two. Uh, we did this a while a little bit earlier today. UI content H two. This is affecting heading twos. So if I had a different font, we downloaded two fonts. Remember. So if I wanted to have a secondary font, I need some sort of setup like this as well. I have my anagram font, and I have also, in my case, um, arm wrestler. So in here I have the same sort of thing that I've got the actual font files, and a how to use it in CSS. So if I also put those arm wrestler font files in my project in there, the CS the style sheet is going to be very similar. They're both called style sheet. That's why I wouldn't really just drop the style sheet into it. But arm wrestler bold as opposed to anagram regular. I can have multiple of these. So if I copy the other at font face. To my project there, and I have the ability to use Arm Wrestler Bold as well as Anagram Regular. I can use that secondary font on my H2. So H1s are going to have anagram regular, and then H2s are going to have arm wrestler bold. Quick test in the, in the browser. There we go. So it is different. It's just, it's, there we go. You can see it's different like on the T. When we're testing it in Font Squirrel, it may look really nice there, but then when we actually apply it to our app, it may be too much. So here I am putting the same arm wrestler font at the top. It's a little bit more conservative, looks a little nicer. Um, but it, that's what I might need for the readability. So that works there. Um, that works. As um, as some new fonts, but 
we're, we're seeing we can easily clutter up our project. And uh, if you'd like it further organized, I'll, I'll do a quick bit of organization here if you'd like, but it works as is as I have it here. And by organization, what I would say is, well, if I put my fonts in a subfolder, all these fonts, I could have 20 different fonts in a nice folder so it keeps my project clean, and then I'd rewrite my CSS a bit. So if you want to try this, I'm going to create a folder in the project called Fonts, and I will put all of my fonts into that folder. That will require that I rewrite the CSS, because the CSS is pointing to files in the same level as the CSS file. The CSS file, by the path that's there, assume that the fonts are in the same level as the, C as the codica.css code. Well, now if I move all of my fonts into a fonts folder, my um, my fonts that were working no longer work, and they actually default to even something else, perhaps. Well, that's because my source isn't pointing to the right folder anymore. Easy fix in the Kodika CSS file. Easy fix, but annoying. In that all of these URLs are pointing to files in the current folder. I would need to write fonts. Uh, is it slash or backslash? We'll see. So fonts, all of these are going to need slash. All of these are going to need um, a prefix of fonts. Uh, did I call it font or fonts? Fonts. So you're going to need the name of the folder where these fonts are at. So now that font face CSS selector will find your file, and I need to do the same thing for the other one if I'm going to use that other font. So a little copy and paste saves me some effort. Fonts slash, go to the fonts folder, and then you will find those fonts. Font files. And if I took a quick look as a quick refresh there, then it finds them again. If I want the full effect, I have to um, run it through Taco. And then on my device, that's the way I can fully test it to see how my those fonts look in my um, in my real device. That's the latest version, and then I'll also run this on a real device. So at the beginning of the day, very plain, new colors chosen. And now, new fonts. This is launching the latest version of my app on my device.
and you're seeing there it's pretty smooth, pretty sharp. Got the new font, the, both of the new fonts. Maybe that top um, text is a little small, so then I would go in and further refine the size of my H1. Where we had it right over, over here. So at a 1.1 M, which looked fine on a plain old sans serif font. This one's a little bit more ornate. So if I make it a little larger, maybe a 1.2, 1.5. So based on the font itself, then it'll look a little bigger, a little more readable, and that'll be the new size at the top of my app. The one for the headings, I think, looks just fine. And it's got the, the different font. So it's a more a little bit more plain font, but it has some flourishes in the design. And this this process then of um, going over to Font Squirrel and kind of taking a test drive of all of these because something might look really nice hand drawn, like three dumb. But if I take a test drive and I see it on different sizes, that's that looks really good that big, but then when it's on the size of the device, not so good. And again, this one looks good here, but not when it's on the device, when it has to be that small. And we will see oftentimes the more interesting looking fonts always look the best when they are larger. So, you know, Chichenko here might look good, but then you're going to lose some of these little flourishes, like there's a little squiggliness right there that you're going to lose once it's actually not pressed down, so that four won't look as nice. If you are going to use a large size, something like yard sale, that would probably look pretty good at different big sizes. And then stick with something a little bit more normal, like um, probably over on sans serif. They all kind of then to some degree look like um, Arial, but it's a, there's a reason why you know Arial style fonts are so popular and Helvetica because they're very readable, but they still have a little bit of, of their own personality. And that they, little, those B's and such look a little bit different. It's a little different than that. But these are very readable. There's a search term of paragraphs, so that just shows you fonts that look good as a paragraph text. And yeah, they're going to be a little bit more boring, but they are going to look nice for readable text. Again, user experience is the most important thing. User experience is that the user is going to use our app and use it um, willingly and without much friction. And simply if it's a chore to view, to read, that's annoying and they're not going to have much incentive to keep coming back to your app. It's very easy to make apps very ugly. It's a little harder to make them nice because you have these rules of graphic design which we don't have time to really cover a lot, but as I've said, um, plainer fonts are easier to read. Crazier fonts are good if they're big. We got this to work at this point. Very good. We'll take one more break. When we come back, we'll do a little bit more. Hopefully, you got your font to work. If not, call me over, and then we'll we'll proceed in a little bit. It's uh, eight thirty. We'll come back at eight forty.